Good morning, everyone. It's good to be with you this morning, and I just want to say thanks for continuing to join with us online <clears throat> um, all these months and all through this last year. Um, it's good to have an opportunity to worship together, and so I'm glad that you're here today. Uh, if you are on here for the first time, please make sure you make a comment or something so that we know that you're there. And even for those of you who are regular, um, if you could just make a comment, share this video or like it, uh, invite somebody to join with you. It's like inviting somebody to church. Um, we're going to get started in just a little bit so you can download the message notes from our website. I've got the link here provided for you as well. Uh, message slides so like you can follow along with the outline and uh, and the things that are on the screen and you can look back at those while you're listening to the message and we have an e-connection card that we'd like for you to fill out let us know if you have any prayer requests if you have a change of information if you are new you can tell us who you are and how to contact you that would be great um, and the link is provided for that right here as well and uh, don't forget to get your communion ready and to make sure that you're ready for that when the time comes it will be earlier in the service so make sure you're prepared for that again looking forward to the time to be together and as we uh, get ready get closer to the beginning of the service uh, i just pray that you will have a good one that even though we're apart we can uh, celebrate and worship together um, the god who uh, holds all things together thank you for being here today uh, let's pray God, we're so thankful for all that you do for us and the kindness you show us every day and the blessings you give us, even when we're not counting on them, even when we're not expecting them, and sometimes when we don't even see them. Just simple things like air and water and shelter and air conditioning. Little things all the time that we are blessed with that we take for granted. We just thank you for the things that you provide for us. And out of all the planets in space, this is the one planet that seems to have everything we need. And it's because you have placed us here for that reason. Thank you for everything you do. In Jesus' name, amen. And let's uh, have a good service. Good morning, Crossroads. It's good to be with you. Well, we're going to do another acoustic set. If you were here at all this week, you know that this stage was absolutely covered with kid stuff and we we're trying to figure out how to get around it it's like well let's just do a acoustic set because that's the easy way to go and totally worth it. it man the kids had a blast here this week it was a good time would you stand and we'll worship together
We got a great service in store for you this morning. Go ahead and be seated. We're going to have the announcement time. Good morning. So we're doing things a little different today. So I'm going to do the announcements now. But before you do that, I want everybody to wave at the camera because we are hosting online services. And every week we have a good chunk of people that are on there. So I want to say hi to the Thomases, to the Carlsons, and then also to Patsy. So I know there's more on there, but I just saw their names on there just a second ago. So we have a couple of announcements. One of them is our um, Back to School Bash that's coming up this Saturday. And this is a program to try to help it reach out to the community and help them out with school supplies and also connect to the church. And so um, we are c accepting the donations for clothes and school supplies today. Today is technically the last day of donation, but if you forgot, you can bring those earlier in the week. Um, if you would do that as soon as possible, that way we can get those sorted out and, and uh, separated properly and kind of get, take some inventory on what we got. That would be great. And then also there is uh, still lots of opportunities for ways that you can help out during that event, which is on Saturday. And uh, if you will go to your bulletin, and then there's an events tab on our website, um, a place where you can see all the different opportunities where you can volunteer and uh, sign up for that as well, okay? And then the last one is our Get Her Done. Uh, it's a primetime event thing uh, on August 4th. And instead of having a program, we're actually just asking people to come and contribute in kind of touching up some of our building, helping out different ministry teams. We will be having some groups, some people um, helping out with the back to school bash inventory. Um, we will be, I'm going to be leading uh, washing exterior windows because they're filthy. So I don't know if you've seen them, but you can go look at them. And if you're disgusted, then come on Wednesday, August 4th. Okay. Uh, and you will be disgusted. So, <laughs> uh, but we'll just have all kinds of different jobs that you can do for that. And so we just want to encourage you guys to come to that. Okay. Well, let's, uh, let's uh, stand up and we'll get started on our next song and start getting into our time of worship with God.
Father God, just uh, lift up this morning to you. Uh, Jesus, we're here and we're ready to receive from you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Would you please be seated? So that's just a snippet of what these guys have been up to throughout this summer. And I wanted to take just a couple moments um, and recognize our our kids team, starting with our our kids pastor, uh, Matt Richards, and and, uh, his wife, Stephanie, who refused to come on stage this morning. But she's sitting right there for anybody who, she's the one who's shaking her head and waving with, uh, she's not waving. Um, But I just want to recognize them because... um, I know, like, I didn't realize Titus was going to be up here destroying everything, so I'm kind of looking both ways, so forgive me on that one, but just wanted to let him take a few moments, show off these, these faces, and let him talk about what they've been doing all summer long here. Yeah, we just wanted you to see what happens a little bit down the hallway. This is what happens. And you got to see some of the summer, you got to see some of the different things we're doing, but if you haven't worshipped with a group like this before, you haven't worshipped. Uh, I'm telling you the truth. If you have not worshipped with these guys, then you haven't ever worshipped before. These guys worship with pure abandonment, 
like David dancing his underwear, like in the Bible, that's these guys uh, with a few more clothes, all right? And we love them, we love worshiping with them. We got to experience all kinds of things this summer and you guys got to see a glimpse of that. We took 23 campers to Hidden Haven Christian Camp. You also got to see um, our old playground was absolutely loved by the little guys. I mean, they climbed all over that thing. It was a perfect addition for camp. Um, we had one baptism at camp. We have one next week. And we have one in the next coming week. So we have two more coming because of things that happened this summer. Um, and then, yeah. One of those, one uh, actually, yeah, the one that got baptized, she's on vacation. One and the other two that are going to get baptized are looking at you right now. Um, so 22 preschoolers went to our very first preschool-only VBS. That was absolutely amazing. We had fun. And these little guys learned that they have a mission, a deep-sea mission to tell the world about Jesus. And then um, last time I threw some T-shirts at you guys, and I told you we had 52 campers signed up for Connect Camps. Because of your guys' effort, because of the things you did and the coupon codes that we gave you and you used, we finished with 80, right? And so that was exciting because of those 80, 14 of them told us they had no church whatsoever. Tw uh, 21 others said they go to another church and 45 were from right here in our building. And you see probably some of them right here. Um, but of those 80, oh, look at there, all right, of those 80, 14 want me to call them and tell them about Crossroads, even more about Crossroads. Three, three have asked in that conversation to, be, to ask about salvation and baptism, so we'll follow up with those um, as we go in the next few weeks, which takes me to communion. It takes me to... Communion is many times seen as a somber moment, a solemn moment. But today I want it to be a celebration. I don't, as you look at these kids, I don't want you to see the future of the church. They are the church. They are Crossroads. They are the heartbeat of what we do and what we believe just stuck in a corner down there. No, when we go down the hallway, we're going to do our own worship service. We're going to dance. We're going to praise. We're going to do all the things that you're doing in here, we do down there. And I want you to know that. I want you to see these faces, and I want you to pray for these faces. And as you take communion today, I want you to celebrate that God didn't stay dead. God is alive and active. sacrifice our own lives and our own time. May we, as, as Romans 12 says, be living in holy sacrifices for you because of what you did on the cross for us. And the fact that you didn't stay dead, you came back to life and you gave us the gift of the Holy Spirit. May we pass that on to generations and generations and generations to come. It's in the wonderful name of Jesus we pray and we celebrate.
this is unfailing love that you would take my place that you would bear my cross you would lay down your life that I would be set free oh Jesus I sing for all that you've done this is amazing. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. That you would bear. God, we thank you for everything you do for us, for an amazing summer for the kids, for the youth. Thank you for the vehicle of the church to make all these things happen. God, we love you. Thank you for the next generation of believers. It's in your name we pray. Matthew 6, verses 25 through 34, and I will be reading from the New International Version. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink or what you will wear. Is not life more important than food and the body more important than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Who of you, by worrying, can add a single hour to his life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the lilies of the field grow. They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and is thrown into the fire of tomorrow, will he not much more clothe you, O oh, you of little faith? So do not worry, saying, What shall we eat, what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that they need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. So why did I pick this passage of scripture to be my favorite when I'm not a worrier? Well, maybe. Last week when Kurt reached out to me and asked me to make a video for today's sermon, just maybe I started to worry about what I would say. And just maybe I'm one of those that bought extra toilet paper for COVID. Actually, the real reason I picked this passage is I love sitting out on the patio and watching and listening to the birds, enjoying all the flowers, and just knowing that if God put so much care into creating those, how much more he cares for me. Our purpose in life is to glorify God, but if I'm spending all of my time worrying, then I am not giving God glory. I'm just giving myself stress. For me, I feel that excessive anxiety is a lack of faith, so I just want to every day to practice this Matthew 6 passage by not worrying and just putting my trust in God because I know he does care about every detail of my life. Besides, if God isn't sleeping and he's watching out for me, there's no reason for both of us to stay up. Wanda um, reluctantly agreed to do the video and then said, well, I'm not going to be there anyway. So you can let them, uh, them deal with it. But, uh, you know, I, I, I think about 
her talking right there, what she said, and, and uh, you know, it kind of dawned on me this week. I've spent the better part of the last decade where pretty much every day of my life, I'm just buried in Scripture. Uh, I, I spend sometimes hours a day in the Bible. Now, I'm not saying that to give you like this, hey, look at how, you know, how holy I am or anything like that. That's just kind of the life of a, of a, a pastor. Like in Bible college, I mean, every class is about the Bible. And so you'd basically learn line by line, word by word, Scripture, even into the Greek or the Hebrew and, and, and the parts of speech and, and all of that. Uh, when you get into ministry, especially in a, a preaching or a teaching role, you're, you're spending hours a week in the Bible so that I can break Scripture down and I can relearn it myself so that I can come here and teach it. Uh, that's just kind of the way I go. Some of you can kind of relate to this because maybe some of you do a reading plan where you're reading through the Bible in X amount of months or, or in a year or, or whatever. And sometimes you're reading to read. Well, I've got these three chapters I have to read today. So you read them and they don't always, they don't always hit. Like some of you are nodding your heads like you kind of understand where I'm coming from. Sometimes it's easy to fall into a trap of reading for the sake of reading. But every so often... I come across a passage that no matter how many times I've heard it, no matter how many times I've read it, how many times I have seen or heard a sermon or a lesson on it, it stops me in my tracks and it grabs me by the shoulders and it says, sit down and listen. And Matthew chapter 6 is one of those. Because in this, this passage, Jesus starts it off with such a simple And yet such a difficult command for us to grab a hold of, it's the simple three-word command, do not worry. I say it's simple and it's complex because if you think about it, it's easy to hear those words, but how many of you, when you are in the middle of being worried, when somebody walks up and says, hey, don't worry, calm down, you are like, oh, you know what, you're right, I should just do that, okay? (laughs) Men, how many times have you tried this with your wife? Does it work? Honey, just calm down. Like when you wake up from being knocked out, you know, 30 minutes later, are you, has she calmed down, right? It's not that simple. But I love this passage because in it, God, or Jesus tells us not to worry, but then he comes back and he tells us, tells us the why. And before we jump into this this morning, I want to step back and and talk about this topic for just a minute here, worry, anxiety, kind of, kind of talk about why we're going to talk about this a little bit. Because anxiety has become like its own pandemic in the world today. Anxiety is the number one health issue for women in the United States today. Number one health issue. And it's the number two health issue for men today. Okay? Anxiety Uh, affects over 20% of the adult population in the United States. And by the way, all these numbers I'm giving you are from the end of 2019. We haven't even figured out and factored in the last year and a half yet. Okay, so these numbers are probably higher now than they were then. But anxiety not only affects adults, it's starting to affect an incredible number of teenagers as well. Over 25% of the teenagers in the U.S. deal with anxiety. I turned 39 last week. It was, you know, 20, 25 years ago. I was a teenager in high school, and we had anxiety then, but we had nothing like the kids deal with today. Nothing like it. Our world was a little more stable and structured back in the 90s. But anxiety is such a problem that in 2019, Americans spent just under $50 billion treating anxiety. Anxiety is the underlying foundational root cause for depression, for sleep disorders, for eating disorders, for adult ADHD, for, um, gosh, everything, substance abuse, even irritable bowel syndrome. Like, anxiety affects everything. And the question is, is why? Why, is, why are we such an anxious society? You think about it, we've never been safer as a society right now. We have better health care than we've ever had. Uh, we, we've got uh, more... more, more Stable and secure financial institutions. Our our banks are secure. If if we lose money, it's easy to track it and find it and get it back. I mean, everything seems to be safer right now. I mean, gosh, we even can't let our kids ride bikes without helmets anymore. Like, as a kid, I think I wore a bicycle helmet twice ever. 
And that's just because I, I saw it and it was really cool looking and wanted to wear it. <laughs> like, we didn't wear them, right? We, we track everything these days. So why, why are we so anxious? I've got a couple of ideas, a couple of reasons. You can take these for whatever you want to take them for. One of them, and I don't mean to over-spiritualize this, even though I'm going to spiritualize it later. I don't mean to over-spiritualize this reason. As we have removed God from our lives, anxiety has gone up. I can show you two graphs. You can put them side by side, and they form two halves of an X going in opposite directions. As the average American family, church has, uh, attendance has decreased. Anxiety has increased at the same rate. You can do whatever you want with those numbers. For me, that's a pretty direct correlation. We've removed God from the equation, and we've tried to take control of things ourselves. Here's the second reason, I think. We are a less socially connected society than ever before and a more digitally connected society than ever before. And yes, the last year and a half has blown this completely out of the water, but even before COVID, we were trending in this direction. I mean, we online shop. I mean, Amazon was huge before COVID, right? Online shopping was big before COVID. These things already existed. We've replaced meetings with Zoom and, and, and Microsoft Teams and GoToMeeting even before COVID because it's cheaper. And it's practical, right? It makes sense. There's good things about it. I don't mean to dog on these things. But that's caused us to lose some social interaction with each other. And, and as a result of that, or maybe because of that or alongside of that, we find things out so much faster than ever before. Like we find out breaking news as it's happening often. And then not only do we find out about it as it's happening, before we can even digest and process what's happened, we're being told what to think about it and how to respond to it and how to react to it. Uh, when I was a, a teenager, again, back in the 90s, I was on track. I wanted to go into journalism and do broadcasting, and, and I loved the news. I, I, I just watched the news and watch journalists and learn their voices and, and learn their, their cadence and their tone and all this. I got this book called We Interrupt This Broadcast, and it was basically starting in the 30s with the Hindenburg up through the late 90s. Every major breaking news event, they had on CD whatever was playing on the radio or on TV, and then about 10 seconds into what was playing, they, they showed it breaking into the coverage, breaking into the news, breaking into what was going on. And I loved that. And I thought, man, so many people can tell me or tell you, maybe some of you guys or some of these people exactly what you were doing when you heard the news about fill in the blank, JFK's assassination, President Nixon resigning, et cetera, et cetera. Now, like, we're finding stuff out, again, as it happens, before the news even has a chance to pick it up and run with it. And I think when we do that, that just fuels our anxiety. We don't have time to stop and process like, our brains don't work quite that fast. And so I thought about this. What exactly is anxiety? Last week, Brad talked about fear. And it was funny because Brad talks about fear, and then he comes to my office and he goes, I'm afraid that our sermons might overlap. I'm like, well, are you afraid or are you anxious? Because if you're anxious, you need to sit and we'll talk about anxiety and what's going to happen. And, and uh, he didn't think that was funny, and he left. And, um <laughs> But, uh, and then he went on vacation for a week on his motorcycle, so he, he got as far away as he could. Um, but fear and anxiety, they're similar, but they're not the same. They're, they're more like cousins than they are siblings. So fear, for example, fear sees a threat and reacts to it. There's a snake, step back. Fear creates a fight or flight instinct. You see a snake, you have a couple options, remove the snake or remove yourself. Or stand there and see what happens, I guess. But it's a fight or flight reaction. There's a snake in the grass. I've got to go somewhere else. Anxiety or worry imagines a threat and can't move on from it. I saw a snake in the grass one time. I'm never going in my yard again. That's anxiety. That's worry. Uh, Elsie, uh, you saw her out here with the kids a little bit ago. We lived in Oregon. She found out there were bears in Oregon. So she didn't even want to go in our backyard. And I'm like, we live in town. The bears are like way out in the mountains, you know. But there might be a bear there. So she didn't want to go outside. Anxiety has been described as like a tidal wave of what if. 
We just constantly ask the question all the time. What if I never meet that special someone? What if I meet that someone and they get married and they turn out to not be who I wanted them to be and I'm stuck? What if they leave me? What if, what if this happens? What if one of, one of us dies earlier? Or, or what if we can't have kids? Or what if we do have kids and they never move out? Or, or what if we have kids and they move out and they have kids and then they move back in? And, and I mean, just on and on and on, right? It's a tidal wave of what if. And when we start doing a tidal wave of what if, we start preparing for every theoretical thing that could happen. And that pushes us to anxiety. Fear, fear can be good. Brad mentioned this last week. Fear can be good because fear protects us. Okay? I don't want my kids playing in the road. Why? Because they might get, something might happen to them. They might get hit. So that fear keeps my kids in the backyard, inside the fence. Fear can protect us if it's temporary, but anxiety won't let go. Anxiety clings and won't let you go. Now, if you struggle with anxiety, and I'm just based on the stats, assuming some of you do. If you struggle with anxiety, take a deep breath. Okay, I'm not going to tell you to calm down, but take a deep breath. Okay, because even talking about anxiety is making your anxiety climb even talking about it. And specifically because we're sitting in church today, some of you are thinking, man, we, we can't talk about anxiety in church. That's, that's a taboo topic. We're not supposed to talk about this because we're not supposed to be anxious. And maybe that's because you were like me. Like when I was younger, I was taught that we shouldn't fear, we shouldn't worry, we shouldn't have anxiety. It's a sign of a lack of faith if we do. And, and if you were taught that, chances are you're like I was. You're taught by someone who meant well and just got it off a little bit. Like they weren't trying to mess you up. They weren't trying to tell you, just toughen up and get over it. Because here's the thing about anxiety. The Bible has plenty to say. In fact, did you know what the most highlighted verse in the entire Bible is? It's not John 3.16. It's not Psalm 23. It's Philippians 4, chapter, uh, chapter 4, verse 6. When Paul says... Do not be anxious about anything. That's the most highlighted verse in the Bible. Do not be anxious about anything. This verse, it's written in the present active tense, meaning it's an ongoing command. And what Paul's saying here is, hey, it's wrong to be anxious. He's not saying that. What he's saying is, don't let it grab a hold of you and not let go. Like, we're going to have moments we get anxious. Don't let them dominate your life. Don't let worry and anxiety cling to you. There's a book uh, that was written a couple, of, a couple of years ago by Max Licato called Anxious for Nothing. And if you struggle with anxiety, I would recommend, grab that book. It's, it's an easy read, and it just follows that Philippians 4 passage. But in the book, he says this, the presence of anxiety is unavoidable, but the prison of anxiety is optional. I want to stop for just a moment before I go any further. And I want to put a little little disclaimer out there about anxiety. Because there is a level of anxiety that we can get in our lives where it is perfectly okay, perfectly acceptable to seek professional help. Some of you are so wrecked with it right now that it is completely okay to go talk to somebody. God gave us people who became doctors or counselors or therapists for a reason. There is no shame in that and never ever let anybody, especially in the church, tell you otherwise. Because God has given us these amazing people to help us out. So it's perfectly okay to seek therapy, counseling, even medication if you need to, because there is no reason to let anxiety just control and dominate your life. And I'm not saying this because anxiety is a hot topic in our our culture or in our chatter right now. I mean, coming out of the Olympics and what's going on with the gymnastics stuff, I see it all over Facebook. Toughen up. Let's go. Like, it's not that simple. And it's not just a practical issue. I think anxiety is a deeply spiritual issue. And I say that because in that Philippians 4 verse, when Paul says, do not be anxious, the Greek word that's translated to, to, uh, to say, to be anxious, is this word here. It's marimna. That's the Greek word. Marimna, when you, when you translate it out, it gives you this idea, this illustration of your mind firing in 100,000 different directions at one time. Just constantly all over the place. And some of you are like, yeah, that, that's me. That's me sometimes. 
My mind is just going in a million directions at once. When that's happening, it's hard to focus on one thing in particular. Now, I believe this. I believe that God created us to have our heart and our mind and our soul completely, totally focused on him. And if that's the case, if God did create us and wire us in a way to be completely, totally focused on him, does it not make sense that we have an enemy that would try to scramble our minds into 100,000 different directions at once? Thinking about anything except him. Thinking about all the stuff that could possibly go wrong. That's why when I'm reading through my Bible and I come to Matthew chapter 6, I stop in my tracks and I pay attention. Because Jesus doesn't waste any time in this passage. He starts right out of the chute. Matthew chapter 6, verse 25, he says, This is why I tell you, do not worry about everyday life. I love the first few words of this. This is why I tell you. A lot of translations will say, therefore. A little, little Bible college saying here for you. When you're reading the Bible and you come across the word, therefore, you ask the question, what is therefore? Therefore. And you go back and you reread what you just read. Now, I like this because I said something in my last sermon and afterwards, somebody goes, that sounded just like Brad. And it wasn't a compliment. <laughs> because I have a tendency to explain the context of what I'm about to say so that it makes more sense when I say it. And so I said the phrase, I say all that to say, which apparently is a Brad Fangmanism. <laughs> I didn't know that. And I say it all the time. And apparently that's why he hired me. I'm not sure. But um, <laughs> I thought about that because I thought, man, that's like the preacher version of saying, therefore. So maybe I'm not that different than the Apostle Paul or, or I'm not going to go any further with that line right there before I get myself in trouble. But we say that to say, when we see this is why I tell you, you look back at what you just read. And what Jesus just said, when you go back through the Sermon on the Mount, he spent chapter 5 giving us this list of blessings and then giving us this list of, of hey, don't do this, instead do this. And then in chapter 6, he, he gives you three examples of when you do this thing to help other people, do it this way. And then in chapter 6, verse 19, he starts talking about money, because that's everyone's favorite sermon topic, is money. And he gives us a simple command. Don't store up and, and invest in earthly treasures. Do it in eternal treasures instead. And he follows that up by saying, now, I tell you this to say, don't worry. And specifically, he goes on, don't worry about everyday life, whether you have enough food and drink or enough clothes to wear. Isn't life more than food or your body more than clothing. He, he gives us this, this command, and then he starts going into the why. He breaks it down further. He says, look at the birds. Look at the birds of the air. They don't work for their food, and, and I take care of them. I feed them. And I love how he ends this up. Aren't you far more valuable than they are? And then look at the flowers. The flowers don't work. They don't toil. They don't sow. They don't do anything. And look how beautiful they are. And, and he says in verse 30, this, this creates a great reminder for us in verse 30. He says, if God cares so wonderfully for the wildflowers that are here today and thrown into the fire tomorrow, he'll certainly care for you. Husbands, maybe, maybe you're one of these who you don't like to give your wife flowers because they're expensive and they're going to die in three days. And God says, forget about that. Look how beautiful they are. And even though, yeah, they're going to die in three days, I made them beautiful. So guess what? I'm going to do the same for you because I care much more about you than I do them. Why? Why does God care more about us than them? Well, the answer is found clear back in the beginning of your Bible. Genesis chapter 1. God has just created everything, and then he pauses, and then he comes back and says, let us make human beings in our image. This is plural. This is the Trinity. This is the Father, the Son, and the Spirit in creation. Let us make human beings in our image. This verse has come to me a lot lately. 
I said earlier I turned 39 last week. In, in my 39 years, I've been blessed to get to see some amazing parts of creation. Uh, the Gulf Coast of Florida. I, I grew up in middle America, you know, just straight south of here a couple hours. So this part of the country is about as far as you can get, you know, from a large body of water. And, and so... Growing up, I always wondered what, what all the oceans looked like or the Gulf looked like. And, and in the last five years, we lived an hour and a half from the Pacific Ocean and got to go see sunsets over the Pacific and, and got to see this. In fact, I've got some friends who are there right now bragging about their, their, their trip to Destin. The water, if you've never been there, it's crystal clear and green. It's beautiful. It's warm. There's a big area that's like a lagoon you can just hang out in and swim in and wade in. Beautiful. One of my favorite places on earth is Crater Lake. We live just a short distance from there in Oregon. Crater Lake, this old volcano that erupted and, and collapsed in on itself and then filled up with 2,000 feet of crystal clear water, the purest water in the Western Hemisphere. And I can look across here. It's, it's eight miles across in all directions. And just, just I, I could sit there for hours and just take it in. Or... Uh, times I'd gone to Colorado and gone to Rocky Mountain National Park, or this is actually a picture in Oregon, about 20 minutes from our house we lived in. I'd just get in my Jeep and drive up there to get away sometimes, and sit out there on the edge and look across and just look at all the little bumps in the mountain and all the trees and, and all of this amazing, beautiful creation that I could see. Or we could drive south an hour and be in the redwoods, and we could see these 300-foot tall trees just all over the place. And these trunks that are like 40 or 50 feet thick. And, and we've got pictures of us where a tree's fallen over, where they've had to cut one down because it was dying. They just leave it there and you can stand next to it and just feel so, so small. Like I don't show you those to say, hey, look how cool vacations I've gone on. No, I show this to say there are times I look at God's amazing creations and I feel tiny and insignificant. Before we moved here, we were uh, down in, in, in Southern California with uh, Jennifer's sister and her husband, looking out across the ocean. And I'm thinking, man, Japan's over there somewhere, <laughs> what, 7,000 miles. I feel small, knowing this is the same water that's touching South America right now, the same water that's touching Hawaii right now. I feel small and tiny. And then I step back and I read Matthew 6, and I read Genesis 126. And that of all of this, these trees and these, these beautiful mountains and all these animals, he picked me and you to be in his image, humans. And, and it, it just stops me because it, it blows me away to think the God of the universe would do that. David thought the same thing in Psalm 8. He said this, O Lord, our Lord, your majestic name fills the earth. Your glory is higher than the heavens. When I look at the night sky and I see the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars that you set in place, what are mere mortals that you should think about them? Human beings that you should care for them. That stops me in my tracks. Because I know for me, when I stop and I remember that it's me that's made in his image, or you that's made in his image, and I, I focus on that suddenly... My worries don't seem so big. Suddenly, my anxieties don't seem so strong. Suddenly, it's easier to start grabbing and wrapping my mind around the idea that God truly loves me. And it leaves me with this simple fact that helps that God is in control. He's in control. He's got it. It's not me that has to figure everything out. It's him. He's got it. He's sovereign. He's always been sovereign and he always will be. And when I stop and grab a hold of that, then there's cause to celebrate and a little less cause to worry. I gave you earlier that, that passage in Philippians chapter 4. You jump up a few verses when that passage starts, and Paul starts it this way in verse 4. He says, always be full of joy in the Lord. I'll say it again. Rejoice. Always be full of joy. That's, a, that's an active command. Always be full of joy. And he even has to repeat himself. He doesn't just say it once. He repeats it. He's so sure of it. He has to repeat it. I say it again. Rejoice. It doesn't mean that we won't ever deal with with anxiety or worry, but he's saying, just focus on God. 
Don't think about this other stuff. Focus on him. And here's what we need to remember. Rejoicing and celebrating, Matt talked about this a little bit ago in communion, that's not an emotional decision. I know a lot of you are sports fans, and, and you might go watch the Royals, or you might go watch the Chiefs, or, or you might watch a game on TV. When somebody hits a home run, or when they score a touchdown, or something happens, we jump and we celebrate. That's an emotional reaction. When things don't go well, maybe we get upset, or we throw things, or maybe that's just me. But it's an emotional reaction. Celebrating God, rejoicing in God is not an emotional reaction. Okay, rejoicing in God is a decision that is firmly rooted in what God has already done for you. For me, it's easier to, re to, to rejoice and focus on him because I can look back and I know what he's done. And because I know what he's done, I know I can trust him. But here's the kicker. Trust, trust requires giving up control. Trust requires giving up control. Often, we think that we're in control of something. Well, let's be honest, we're not. We're not in control of anything. We think that we are, and when we are, that calms us down. When you're in control of a situation, you don't have to wonder or worry how, how bad somebody else might mess it up. Because you're in control. You're in charge. But again, that just is like perceived calm, perceived control. Lack of trust will fuel anxiety. But anxiety increases as our control diminishes. But think about this for a second here. How many of you, you're not flying the airplane, but you won't get on board without your own parachute? Or you'll go eat at a restaurant. You're not cooking the food, but you're going to bring your own silverware and maybe your own seasonings with you, just in case. I joke about that at our church in Oregon. We actually had a guy, I'm not making this up, he kept a baggie in his car and it was funny, we, we went to a restaurant, and we said he pulls this baggie out of his pocket. I'm like, what's happening here? Like, I know this is Oregon, but what's happening here, okay? It was Montreal steak seasoning. He had to bring his own seasoning to the restaurant to add to it in case the steak wasn't quite what he wanted. Okay, whatever you think. You, you're the one that picked the restaurant, and you're the one that knows they don't season their food enough, so that's up to you. We can joke about that, but let's get a little more serious. How many of you can't open your heart back up to someone because you've been hurt? Because you can't control what that next person might do to you. See, perceived control creates calm, but that calm is a little bit of a lie. Cruel uh, certainty, certainty is a cruel imposter. I think we all know people who look like they have it all together, and maybe they really do, and then suddenly it all falls apart. Or you know people who have been wealthy and they've lost everything and it wasn't because they made a poor decision, it's because the economy around them crumbled. Or because something else, maybe another business went in. Something happened outside of their control and they lost everything they had. Or maybe worse, maybe we see somebody who is in peak physical condition and they get a terminal diagnosis. Certainty is a cruel imposter. And certainty makes us want control, but the Bible tells us otherwise, that we should give up control. Matt said earlier, their theme verse at, at camp for the kids this year was Romans 12.1, present your bodies as a living sacrifice. Elsie, my nine-year-old, came home just telling us that verse over and over. Give your bodies as a living sacrifice. She told everybody in the family that verse that she, she had memorized. And here's the thing, with anxiety... Anxiety causes us to want to control every potential theoretical thing that could happen. In other words, we're rehearsing chaos. We're preparing for uncertainty. That's what anxiety does. And the Bible tells us to give it up and trust God anyway. Paul wrote Philippians from a Roman prison cell while he's in chains. And he tells the church in Philippi, celebrate Jesus and keep doing what you're doing. This is the one letter Paul writes that's not correcting bad behavior. It's just encouraging them to keep doing what they're doing as he's in prison. Jesus gives us the Sermon on the Mount as an, like a, a road map for how to live in the kingdom outside of yourself. Giving up control. Not worrying about what you can acquire for yourself, but letting yourself live for the kingdom. It's about the sovereignty of God, about trusting God, knowing that he's got it figured out, and therefore we don't have to. Proverbs 21 tells us this, that no human wisdom or understanding or plan can stand against the Lord. 
Hebrews chapter 1 tells us that God created all things and that God sustains all things. And that it's through him that we are. And that through him we will be. This is the God who who knows everything, who spoke the world into existence. He's named all the stars in the sky. He knows every creature that crawls the earth and every plant that grows from the earth. This is the God who created and breathed, uh, breathed life into us. He is the alpha, the omega, the beginning, the end. And he will never, ever leave you, never forsake you, ever. He is God. And I don't know about you, but for me, I can look back at my life and I see this as a God who has never broken a promise, not once. And because of that, I'm confident that he never will. That doesn't always mean everything's played out the way I wanted it to. (laughs) He doesn't answer my prayers like on my timeline or by my methods, you know, because I've got it all figured out. He's the God who knows better. He's the God who's got it figured out. Folks, our world right now is just chaos. Like, you didn't come to church for me to tell you our world is chaos. You know that, right? I don't know what's going to happen in the coming days or weeks or months or years. I don't know how our government, whether that's at the federal level, state level, local level, is going to handle things like COVID, how it's going to handle things like racial tensions, how it's going to handle economic tensions. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know how the next elected officials are going to handle that or the ones after that. I don't know. But what I know is this. The throne of heaven is occupied, and it always has been, and it always will be, and nothing I do or you do or any of us do will ever change that. God is in control, and he always has been, and he always will be. And because of that, because of that, we can celebrate. Here's what I believe. This is kind of the whole sermon in a nutshell, if you want to call it that. Our anxiety will decrease as our understanding of God increases. As one goes up, the other will go down. And you can flip this. If our understanding of God goes down, our anxiety is going to go up. It's just natural. Too often our anxiety is over temporary things. Now that's what... Jesus is talking about Matthew 6. He just got done talking about money and what we invest in and how we should invest in the Father and in the kingdom instead. Here's the thing with with, with temporary things. I don't want to make light of them because temporary things are often necessary things. We just moved into our, our house this week. And I like the house. It's a good house. One of these days, somebody's going to knock that house down and build a new one on top of it. Uh, same, same with wherever you're at, too. We got our furniture in. One of these days, that furniture is going to get thrown out. It's just things are temporary. Some things last a little longer than others, but it's temporary. And Jesus says, focus on the eternal. Focus on him. Paul lays it out a little bit more in detail in Philippians 4. Because verse 6, he tells us, don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all he's done. Then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. In his book, Max Licato goes a little further about anxiety and fear, and he says these words. He says, the mind cannot at the same time be full of God and full of fear. Something that I've started trying to practice a little bit more are ways to interact with the Bible more. And again, I don't say this to say, hey, look at how I'm doing it. You should follow suit or, you know, you should admire me. But I'm doing this because I need to. I've started finding new ways to interact with the Bible. One way to avoid the trap of just reading fast is I've started writing it down by hand. Sounds nuts. But it causes me to slow down and read it like three or four times as I'm writing it down. And it just allows me to, to, to go through a, a much slower progression of absorbing Scripture. I've started reading one of the Proverbs every single day. I just start my day off reading the proverb. It correlates with, today I'll, I'll start, start over, Proverbs chapter 1. Just correlate with the day of the week. Uh, I'm trying to, to, to find a good online series through like right now media or something and let somebody who's much smarter than I am show me their perspective on it. 
and get, just get new ways to absorb Scripture because I find the more time I spend in the Bible, the less time I have to worry about all the stuff going on around me. I find new ways to worship, whether that's listening to a, a playlist on Spotify or you can find uh, plenty of good stuff on YouTube or whatever just to worship. And I'll, sometimes I'll sit in my office and push back from my desk and just listen. Because here's what I think, folks. I think this, that it is through pure, unfiltered worship and intimacy that we can truly find peace with God. Too often, I think that we, we get so worked up over what's going on that we just want to like wring our hands or shake our fists at the world. And what we need to do is just open our palms and hit our knees and just present ourselves before God. Intimate, raw worship. I mean, this is just, I'm, I'm speaking from my own experience here. When I do that, when those storms of life hit me, they don't hit me as hard. Uh, back in the 1870s, a man by the name of Horatio Spafford, he was a, a lawyer, a businessman in Chicago, uh, lost everything he had in the, the Chicago fire of 1871. Lost his business, his life savings, he lost his four-year-old son. And his family, they had, they had four daughters and, and his wife, they, they, they managed to come through it. He started to get back on his feet. A couple of years later, they decided to go to Europe for a vacation. And kind of last minute, he had a business dealing come up and had to stay behind. So his wife and the four daughters took off on the ship for Europe. Two days into their trip, in incredible fog, the ship collided with another ship. And both ships sank and 221 people died including all four of his daughters. His wife survived. She was rescued, made it to Europe, wound up in Wales. And, of course, again, like I said earlier, we get our news instantaneously. This was back before, you know, they got it by telegram. So it was several days had passed when he got the news, and, and several more days passed as he's waiting to find out if anybody in his family survived. He gets a telegram from his wife that just said, I survived alone. So as soon as he could, he dropped everything, and he, he took a train to the coast, and he got on a ship, and he took off for Europe. Two days into his trip, they passed over the exact spot where his family passed away. And as he went back to his cabin that night, and he reflected on what he had lost, and he reflected on everything that had happened over the past couple of years, he prayed. And as he prayed, he was led to just start writing. And what he wrote that night has become one of the most well-known writings of all time. It's a poem that's been put to lyrics, and it starts this way. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot thou hast taught me to say, it is well. It is well with my soul. Jesus told us not to worry. He told us to focus on the eternal. And I know I'm not going to fix your anxiety issues in one sermon. I don't even know how to do that. I'm not going to pretend how, that I know how. I'm not going to pretend that I did. But I can tell you this. When I find life unbearable, I worship. And sometimes I have to force myself to do it, but I do it anyway. And eventually, eventually God starts to crack through my heart and crack through my soul. And yes, even pastors deal with this. If you're dealing with it, man, you're, you're like the rest of us. Jesus wrapped up his, his command on do not worry by telling us what to do. In verse 33, he said, seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously and he'll give you everything you need. And so that's what we're going to do. We're going to close this out a little different today. I'm going to invite you all to stand, and we are going to just worship. We're going to worship our Father. Like Matt said, we're going to worship like those kids did. I got to watch them this week. It was awesome. They don't care what anybody thinks of them. They don't care that you might look at them and go, oh, that's silly. They don't care. They just worshiped. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to worship to our one and true.
In desperation, I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night. Then through the darkness, your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul. The work is finished, the end is written. Jesus Christ, my Lord.
you so much for worshiping with us this morning. And again, the invitation is still open. Whatever is going on in your life, whether big, whether small, we invite you to come talk to one of us. If the Spirit is prompting you, make that decision. Let's sing this closing song together. everybody. We'll see you next week.